I'm Bruce Calder. I'm the VP of Consulting Service here at Cleggan, and I'll be your host today. So I'm talking about the webinar today, the stuff I'm talking about, is about the upcoming materials restrictions, mostly the deadline landscape from now, 2020, till basically the start of 2023. So we're going to talk about what's coming up. So a lot of things. We're going to talk about a lot of things. Um, of course, we're talking about the SCIP database which is a very uh, key subject right now. The requirements, the distributor SSN notification, a lot of the key output elements. And we're going to skip quite a bit of detail because it, it is a near term. Uh, China VOC, which a lot of people are affected about uh, the volatile organic compound restrictions in coatings and ink for electronics. We'll talk a little bit of EU MDR, but only in brief. Those who are involved in it are usually pretty up to speed by now. UK Conformity Assessment, UKCA, is the UK replacement for the CE mark. Uh, we'll talk about also UK REACH. Uh, the US Perfluorinated Substance uh, Notification Requirements, the new more or less restrictions on perfluorinated substances and PFOA at the federal level in the US in coatings on physical products. So we're talking physical product restrictions here. Uh, the new Canadian restrictions coming up, the new Prop 65 substance, and a bit of Q&A. So, uh, the Q&A will, the hope of the webinar will be about 50 minutes. Uh, if you have any questions, put it in the question panel, and I'll try to get to as many as possible at the end. Um, of course, you need help with compliance, especially the laboratory side. It's the easiest, best ways to do compliance for definitely new products is just to do test. Um, especially if you want to sell the product in multiple markets, it solves the problem in weeks. You get a definitive answer. It's far more effective time and money wise than, than trying to do data gathering with all the errors and mistakes in the supply chain and in completeness. Legacy products are a bit more complicated. You don't always have the budget to test all legacy products. So there's a more focused or strategic way to handle them. Um, but if you need anything uh, lab tested for these requirements, especially new products, it's just so much easier to send a new products through testing. Um, just send us a picture, a web link to that email address and it's easy to quote. We just need to know what it is. If you like what we're doing today in terms of talking about stuff and how to do stuff and what's coming up, uh, our monthly or quarterly update uh, services are fantastic. Where we sit down every month or every quarter, depending on what cycle you want to be on, and we talk about the changes and how they affect your products. And you ask questions, interactive, and you get to better understand things. And so it is the fastest, most effective way to absorb what the changes are. One thing that makes it also very effective, we do it for, I think, roughly 80 companies right now. You get to benefit with the communal knowledge. And we're not doing 80 companies at a time. We do one company at a time. We do just you and your stakeholders talk about the changes in your products. When we talk about the new SVHCs, we talk about what they're used in and where they'll be likely to be in your product, if at all. We talk about things your customers have asked you and what it really means and explain it and, and, and how to handle it. So very specific to you. And the cost is excellent because it's a tremendous amount of value for you get because we do it for so many companies. We are not reinventing the wheel too much. We have this incredible wealth of knowledge. Um, and we're here to help. If, of course, on SKIP, really close deadline. When in doubt, depending where you are in the SKIP program, we can help you at any stage. But reach out. We have the most effective way to get to the end. And we'll talk a little bit about it here, where we provide you the templates and get you up to speed and evaluate and do one of your products and create the declaration from that product based on engineering evaluation and, and data you may or may not have. How to handle it, how to handle, this is what my supplier said, it has this chemical or this chemical. This is the template used for that chemical or that chemical like lead oxide is not declarable for this reason. And explain it and then give you all the templates and it gives you all the process to do the work but we'll also have the same process and we can do all the work for you. So really straightforward and then on to registration. So when in doubt, deadline's really soon, you need help with skip, just reach out, we're happy to help. In terms of what's coming up next, in our market space, it is not uncommon for some fellow like myself to throw a whole bunch of legislations up on the screen to create fear. Um, in this particular case, for most of the companies here, 90% of these apply. Now, of course, you're not medical devices. The medical device regulation doesn't apply. For the most part, the Swedish flame retard tax is around consumer products. There is a bit of variation here. But by and large, almost everything here applies to your products. These are all the different things you have to comply to to be able to sell in these marketplaces. These are all the variety of restricted materials requirements. 
So they aren't just stuff thrown out there. Like now we're going to talk about the toy directive, which probably only applies to a small number of you. <laughs> we're talking about all the legislations and restricted materials that by and large apply to you. And it's a lot going on. And sometimes you ever sit down and how many things are going on. So we're used to it. We're well versed in it. So for us, it's pretty normal, but we can understand for everyone else uh, what a challenge um, this can be. One of the most important rules of restricted materials compliance is the things you're most likely to be non-compliant for are the things you didn't know about. And that's one of the places we try to help a lot. In terms of deadlines, there's a lot of stuff coming up. More so for medical. This is a particularly busy year for medical. Of course, if you're going to meet these deadlines, they've probably been working on it for some time. Um, it's probably been a busy couple of years leading up to it. But this is a busy year for everybody. So I'm going to start from left to right. I'm all going to do it briefly because I'm going to go into a lot more of these in details. This webinar isn't really going to be just talking orally about every line here on this one slide because that would be hard to remember. So a lot of things I'm going to go into more detail later. But starting from the left, we're looking at the REACH PFOA restrictions, which is moving over to POP, which kicked in in July. Medical's got a bit of a multi-year reprieve, but everybody else has a restriction of PFOA at 25 parts per billion in physical products. It's actually a restriction. It's like an hour chest restriction, but not 1,000 ppm. It's 25 parts per billion. Um, very recently, there is a change in the U.S. PFAS rule. There is a limit, limitation on PFA, PFOA and a few other fluorinated polymers in coatings and physical products in the U.S. Um, if you bring a product in that has PFOA or similar in a coating, you have to get approval if they notify um, the EPA. So it's not quite a restriction, but it's pretty darn close, and we'll talk about it. So this is the fluorinated coatings on physical products. So it is actually a physical product restriction in the U.S., which doesn't happen very often. Um, in December, we have the Chinese VOC, volatile organic compound. There are VOC limits on inks and coatings and electronics in China as of December. And one of the biggest ones for everybody is the skip deadline. If you have a product with an SPHC in any component, about 0.1% by weight, which most of your products will have, you need to submit it into the database and get a registration number by January 5th, 2021. One of the big ones. Uh, the medical device regulation people had the MDR postponed for a year to do the, the carcinogen, mutagen, reproductive toxin, endocrine disruptor section in May of this year. Um, ROHS has the phthalate restrictions kicking in for medical and monitoring control in July. And they previously had it in, um, everybody else had it in 2017. They pretty well have it in, or 2019, sorry. Um, they have it in 2021. That's the phthalate restrictions. Start of 2022, UK conformity assessment kicks in, UKCA, we'll talk about that. Also, the phthalate restrictions kick into UAE ROHS for medical monitoring control. And then later on in 2022, you're going to start seeing the new Prop 65 substances and eventually the new ROHS substances. You also see the new Canadian restricted substances. So the ROHS substances probably won't be restricted yet at that time, but at least we'll know what they are. So the ROHS list is in process of being extended from 10 substances to more. And the first restrictions should start appearing um, in late 2022. Uh, the new Canadian restrictions should appear by late 2022, early 2023. And we'll talk about those. And a lot of the new Prop 65 substances will be identified next year. We're going to talk about um, that quite a bit and likely having some level of restriction um, in 2022 or a bit later. So a lot of stuff coming up. As you get closer to 2023, things the deadlines are a little more nebulous, a little more variety in there, but a lot of stuff happening right now. So we're going to talk a lot about each of the major salient items. The biggest one, of course, is SKIP, is Substance of Concern Articles as are such in complex objects products. If you have a product that has a substance of very high concern in any component about 0.1% by weight, you have to register the product, the components, and the SVHC and some other data into the database by Jan 5th, 2021. The software is really two pieces. One piece creates the dossier file or the ICID-Z file, which you basically register that file. It's the technical dossier. It's the physical thing. We'll talk about that here in, in a little bit of detail. Um, the software version was available in April. There is not version, but they haven't released it. And they might be released waiting for the final version, the end of October, to add the new element to it. The XML format has been updated, but it hasn't been released online. Um, the second part of the software where you can actually register, which you can't right now, you can create the files right now, but you can't register, will appear at the end of October. Um, so start in November, you'll be able to register. But even today, you'll be, you can create the files that you register in going into November. 
The deadline is January 5th, 2021, which is not that far away. So to put that perspective, uh, we're less than three months away. Um, we are vastly farther away from when the Tiger King was released. So we put that in perspective. The Tiger King was not that long ago. We are now much, much, much closer to the time to the deadline than when Tiger King was released. So to put a perspective on the timeline, there's not a lot of time left. It's a requirement. It's not a restriction. It's a de declaration requirement. Um, you need to be in your products need to be in the system if they have SVHCs, which virtually all complex products do. And you need a skip number to be able to provide others in particular distributors. And so we'll talk a little bit about that. There's not a lot of time left. So you've got a complex product where we just picked this one up off um, on the web. It's complicated laboratory equipment. Um, it has to go in the database because it has a number of declarable components. The one on the top right is one of the most common in electronics. It's lead and high temp solder. So if you have a component like this that has a solder connection inside, that again is soldered later to the board, they can't have the solder inside remelt when they're soldered to the board. So they have to use a solder with a higher melting point inside. So it doesn't melt when you solder. And if you're using tin solder, lead-free solder, you're normally using pure lead, uh, high temperature lead solder inside. It's allowed under ROHS under exemption 7A. You just have to report it. It's not banned, you just have to report it. And this will be very common in, in a device with any kind of power in it, these diodes. Um, if you have an external brick, it's in almost every external brick. Um, it actually is slightly different shape. It stands up on two legs and sideways, but it is high temp solder is in virtually every external power supply, let alone any power components inside the product. Super common, allowed. You just have to declare the lead in the solder, to declare, to declare the lead metal. Um, it'll have tons of lead and brass components, very common in electronics. The picture on the right is a zinc plated lead of lead and brass, but super common, perfectly allowed. Exemption 6C under ROHS, you just need to declare it. It'll have some silicone washers, and silicone is often cured from D6 siloxane monomer. It'll often have residual D6 over 1000 ppm. Allowed, you just have to declare it. And it'll have lead and steel, lead and aluminum, very common things. Um, depending on the LCD screen, if you have, you're watching this on a laptop, if you grab the monitor in your laptop and flex it slightly, you will probably notice that it bends. You try the same thing with your TV, it won't bend. Um, your TV is made of glass, you're, and the LEDs are behind the glass and are shining straight at you. This, your laptop monitor is much thinner. The LEDs are not behind the screen. The LEDs are actually normally near the hinge. So if you look at your laptop, it's, the, the monitor is hinged to the major CPU down below. Um, the LEDs are along that area in that in the display along that hinge and they're pointed upwards. And there is a P, P, uh, PMMA, polymethyl methacrylate, usual uh, plastic, not a glass, in the background, which redirects the light up through and then towards your eyes. Uh, because of the plastic, it has to have some UV resistant. It very commonly has UV 328 or different UV uh, uh, stabilizer. Pretty common, allowed, very common and flexible uh, LED screens. The LED light needs to be redirected towards your eyes and uses polymethyl methacrylate. It's pretty normal stuff. All allowed is just the product, each component that has an SVHC and the SVHCs inside with their safe use instructions and materials codes need to go in the database. So it's really built for each product. It's built on Lego blocks of components with declarable SVHCs. So if you're building one for this MRI, it's really two different groupings. There is a declaration at the product level, which is like the product name, the model number or range of models, the customs code, whether or not it's made in the EU, and then how many of each building block does it have? How many lead and brass components? How many lead and high temp solder? How many uh, EGDME in button cell batteries? Uh, how much dichlorine uh, plus in heat shrink, et cetera. So it'll often have many of them. And so we normally have these generic building blocks, these are the very typical components that I contain SPHCs, and it's a counting exercise, or worst case engineering evaluation, of how many of each they have. And so the top level product is basically just product information, such as customs code and name and model number, and then how many of each component. And inside the components, the component templates are all the SVHC safe use instructions, et cetera. So we're looking at safe use instructions. We're looking at safe use instructions for lead and brass, for lead and high temp solder. And so all the technical materials information are in these components. And so for every product you make, it is really just made up, your declaration will be made up of different declarable common components. If a component does not have an SVHC, you don't have to include it. This is only for the declarable ones. 
and every product you make is probably some variation of the same component templates. So you have to create a declaration of system. Once you're in the system, so the manufacturer has a requirement to register in the system, the distributor also needs to communicate SVHCs. Under uh, Article 33 of REACH, every provider of a product has to communicate to the recipient the SVHCs, which include not just the brand donor, includes the distributor providing it to someone else. So the distributor has to make the communication requirement also, which means they have to register in the system. What normally happens is the manufacturer registers the file, the technical information, gets a registration number, provides the registration number to the distributor, they then have to submit the number to get back their own registration number. They basically have to register your number to get their own registration number. And the product, it's called the simplified skip notification, where you're just registering someone else's number to get your own number. The guidance is called tools to refer to skip data already submitted to Echo. So this is de facto enforcement reality. Your distributor cannot sell your product if it has an SVHC in it, unless you provided them the skip number and they've uploaded and got their own skip number. That is one of the big difference. This isn't some declaration conformity or stamp that some poor fellow in the back room in a closet said the product was good. No, you have to actively provide a registration number so the distributor can submit the number himself and be registered himself or herself and have their own skip number. So the next one, extension of the SSN. So this is a, in the guide, it's a bit of a complicated thing. So the file, the dossier, the technical piece you get submitted can be made by anyone. It can be made by a US company, a European company, an Australian company, a Chinese company, any one of them can create the file, but the submitter has to be European. In reality, the account that submits, that sets up the legal entity has to be in Europe. But once you set up a legal entity, and we can help you with this, you can connect any other user IDs in the same company to leverage that legal entity to do registration submissions. In this particular example, the non-EU entity, we'll say US entity, creates the file, the and then the French entity does the submission. And they get back a skip number. They then, other uh, entities, the same company, can normally shame, share the same skip number. The guidance is a bit vague on that, but right now it's assumed they can use the same skip number. Once they provide the product to a distributor, the distributor needs the skip number to register the product under their name. They don't need the technical file or dossier. They just need your number to submit to get back their own number. And they can't, if you have a product with SVHCs, which virtually every complex product has, you they need your skip number to register to get their own skip number. Otherwise, they cannot sell your product. So the way they do that is two different ways. You can either do it on the bottom, where they can literally individually paste in each skip number, which is like a 30 character number letter, letter alphanumeric uh, number in and submit. You can submit one at a time. Every time submit one, get one back, which seems incredibly painful. And if you want to do that, all the power to you. The other way to do it is they can upload an Excel files of skip numbers and then get back another Excel file of, the, of what their registration is for all those products. Now, one of the easiest ways to do this is once you register your products, there is an export function where you can export all the skip numbers of your products. Um, and then you can provide it to anyone who asks. So the distributor says, hey, I need your skip numbers. Your only requirement is to provide skip numbers in a positive situation, which means there is an SVHC. So if you provide them this Excel file from that you export after you register with all your skip numbers, as long as they upload that from a compliance perspective, a skip perspective, they can sell all your products. You can sit there and worry about which product they sell and assign skip numbers to each, or you can basically provide them one file, say, upload this, you're compliant, we're compliant, everybody can sell, let's go with this. Um, and so that's one of the easiest ways. We're a huge fan of one answer solving everything. So like conflict minerals, somebody asks for conflict minerals, you provide your one file, that makes most people happy, if not all. In this case, it'd be the same sort of thing. If you do it right and export the file from the system, you skip numbers, anyone asks for skip numbers, you just provide the one file, they might not understand it. You might not understand it completely, but it doesn't matter. As long as they upload it and get back their own numbers, they're compliant and they can sell your product. 
So you can go for a long explanation and education of your distributor and what to do and what products what, or you can just accuse the file. As long as you upload this file, you'll get back a new file with all of your numbers and everybody's compliant and we can keep selling. Most companies are not doing this for fun. Like I find this interesting and fun, but not necessarily everybody. They're doing it or you're doing it often because you have to do it to sell into a market. We like having a situation going, what do I have to do? Upload this file, get a new file and I'm done. Do I have to know what's in the file? Not really much easier. So um, one of the easiest ways is once you register is to export the skip numbers and so they can just upload it, get in their own skip numbers and at that point in time they're compliant. If they provide it to another distributor, they can provide their own file to them and move on from there. So uh, we're all a big fan of collecting up end goals. Like the end goals is you're going to have products you sell and the end goal is you're going to have to have uh, skip numbers for all of them. Yes, there's a technical element in between where you have to create these technical dossier files with SVHC and product information and then actually register it. But at the end of the day, the skip number is the end goal. So I always try to figure out what's the best way there. So you have to figure out what products am I selling and have to declare? What are my declarable components? What are my components that have SVHCs? Not necessarily individually, but what types? You have lead and brass. How many lead and brass in this product? Could be three, could be five, as long as you say, five honestly or any number in that area you're compliant you just the important thing is list the lead and brass component what are your declarable components create the product and component templates formats and you what you'll end up finding is use the same component templates over and over again make the i6z files in iEuclid which uh, if you uh, sign up with us easy to show you how to do this then you want to review them normally you want to export in pdf because it's a lot easier to read and have people review and say, hey, this is what we're going to say about yourself, ourselves. Is that cool with everybody? If it is, you literally, after a two button locking the file, you actually just drag drop it in the system and it registers. The registration system is not open until basically November, but it, once the file is created, it's literally a drag drop exercise into the registration system. Then you export skip numbers, either individually or as a file. And then you have this file of skip numbers to provide anyone that so once you register, there's really going to be a button saying, hey, just export all my skip numbers. And if anybody asks, I give them this Excel file. As long as they load, upload my Excel file, skip files of numbers, then it's just Excel file, skip numbers. As long as they upload it and get back an answer, they're compliant. They don't have to worry about the technicalities. If this product has more of this or that. Once they upload it and get back their own skip numbers, they've met their, their simplified compliance requirement. We're a big fan of simplified effective compliance do it right but the main focus is not to overcomplicate our lives is to do it properly and get to the end output so the way we normally do it is phase one we show you the basics we actually explain the rules in more detail and not as fast as what i'm doing today by the way um one thing i did mention earlier is everyone who registered will receive a copy of the slides also, there will be recording of this available in the next couple of days online. If you go to our website and see all our old recordings, it'll likely be on YouTube. On YouTube, you can actually slow it down. Um, so uh, I'm not quite, it's easier to understand for sure. Um, you can, I also sound like I can enunciate instead of actually slurring letters, words together and making whole new words. Um, but if you want to rewatch it, there will be a video on YouTube, the same recording, and you'll be able to slow it down. Um, Anything we've done in the last year or so is also in the same format on our website. So what we do is in more detail, we'd walk through the rules, the process, and then we'd evaluate one of your products with you doing the worst case scenario declaration to explain how to do it. Have the product templates, the component templates, do the Excel declarations first. Human beings like Excel, like I like Euclid and all, but most people are not into that object oriented uh, database software. Doing it into Excel is much easier as a worksheet. We do our worksheet work in Excel or, or Google Sheets or similar, where it's much easier in tabular format to do the work. Then we transfer it into iEuclid, which might seem like a whole painful task. It's not. We're at the points where once you create the component templates, which is all the technical information, creating an iEuclid file for a product is minutes. It is literally entering in the product num a name, the model numbers or model range, depending on what it is the customs code, whether or not it's made in the EU, and then how many of each component template does it have? Attach three of these, two of those, one of those. It's really easy. So we show you how to do it. We'll actually create the iEuclid files for you. And at that point in time, you'll have all the templates, an iEuclid file, the whole process. And then in phase two, which you really should be doing by now because we're only three months out here, um, 
you have all the tools to do it yourself, or we have all the same tools with you and we can just do it for you. So it's really straightforward. We can support you. You can do it for some business units, or you can do it for others. We can do all of your products. We can help with just questions, whatever you're comfortable with. Once you have the process, you'll have the tools. You may not necessarily have all the, the resources to do it, and we can do it for you. It's all the same tools. And then you'll eventually register. You'll submit it in the system, and you'll get back a skip files. There is a non-intuitive step but after that to lock the dossier. After that, it's basically a drag-drop operation. You get back the skip number. It's really easy, uh, very straightforward, three phases. Get the basics, create your first one. Always worthwhile. No matter where you are in your process, I guarantee you're going to learn a lot in the first section. Even if you know a lot of processes, whether it's, it's technical, operational, regulatory, or chemical, we'll explain why MHHPA, for example, is not declarable. Your supplier, especially down at the, at the materials level, will often declare what's in the ingredients of the chemicals that go into it. And any chemical, um, any SVHC residual in it is measured over the weight of whatever it's coated onto or inked onto. Um, adhesives are particular, there are any SVHC left over in the adhesive is measured over the items it adheres to, so over a larger weight. But most SVHCs in the chemical phases are actually, um, they actually react. So even though uh, your potting agent might say uh, methyl hexyl uh, and hydride, um, MHHPA, it, the way it actually works is cross-linker for DEGPA epoxies is it has a bond that breaks and it basically has two arms that are holding hands inside of it and then it breaks and they now have two arms that are not holding hands anymore and each arm grabs onto a different DEGBA polymer um, chain and now it becomes, it cross links or connects, they call it a hardener, it connects the polymer chains and it becomes a brand new chemical where it's attached. It's no longer MHHPA and, that, and that's how it functions. But if you look at the safety data sheet of the ingredients of the you know, the hardener for the epoxy, it'll say MHHPA, but it's not in the final version. That's how it works. Plus any residual MHHPA is measured over the whatever it's adhered to, because it's a chemical up to the point where it's added to the product. So there's a lot of reasons, a lot of technical reasons to explain why lead oxide is leaded glass in most cases, a few exceptions. Um, yes, your circuit board, there is fiberglass in it, E-glass, which is borosilicate glass, Pyrex glass, um, it's made from diboron trioxide, but the industry interpretation, it is now borosilicate glass. It's a different chemical, not declarable. So explaining what you're also getting from your, if you get supplier data, how to manipulate it, but we can do it without supplier data based on worst case scenario declaration. And we walk you through all the different processes. It's the funny thing is we do this for so many, so many companies. It's funny, rarely does any particular company have the same starting point. Um, their bombs are different. Their, the way they, they can scrap their products are different. What data they do and do not have is quite different. It's amazing how different everyone is for this. So we're really good at handling whatever situation you are in. You can say, well, we're not in a really good situation or we're in a great situation. We can handle all of them and show you how do you do it, but also leverage anything you've done. So phase one, we'll show you how to do it. Phase two, you'll have all the tools. We'll show you how to do it. Here's all the tools. Then you can do it and we can support you or we can just do it for you. You know what? You probably have a lot of other things to do in the next three months. We can just do it for you. And then um, register. You submit the files and collect the skip numbers. Often by just pushing a button to output all the skip numbers of all the products you've registered into one file. We like the one file concept. Anybody who asks, they can ask the most complicated thing. That's awesome. Here's our file. Just upload it. We're good. Again, that might be going a bit quickly because I have a lot of material to cover, and I apologize. Um, when we do the output, the component templates are in Excel. Human beings like Excel, not necessarily like Excel, are very used to Excel, and that's what we use for working files. But we'll create the I6Z file with all the component templates embedded in it. It's really cool. You drag the file in if you're, I don't know, blood analyzer or, it ex or your tractor. Put an IU clip, it'll re-expand and all your component templates for that product will suddenly become available for any other product you use. And then we also put a PDF version that has no regulatory purpose other than the fact you can read it. I6Z is, you know, people, a zip file of XML is not necessarily for everyone. Um, some people really like XML. I'm sure the parents are really proud of them. Not my thing. PDF I can do. So the idea is to look at it, review it in PDF form, which is hyperlinked and really, really easy to use. So what are we going to say about ourselves? Here's the XML. Awesome. Do you have a PDF? 
okay, here's the PDF, look at the PDF, understand what you're gonna say, make any updates, and then submit the I6Z file. You don't submit the PDF, that's just for viewing, you submit the I6Z. So if you have any questions about Skip, of course, put them in your control panel. I'll try to get to as many as possible, but feel free to reach out. We can help. We really, really can. Uh, we're very, very good at this, actually. Um, I'm sure everybody says that, but we really are. We produce I6Z files for such a range of products and explain. And it's amazing of what different directions our customers start with. And we can walk you through it. The next one is Chinese volatile organic compound restrictions. There is a new standard in China. It's related to a, uh, China green uh, legislation where there are volatile organic compound limits in coatings and inks for electronics. So it includes uh, UV curable and, and non-UV curable inks and coatings. They have a VOC limit. Now this is at the coating level. Once it's on your product, the volatile part does the volatile thing and goes away. So we're looking really at the coatings and inks applied in China. So whether you know it or not, a number of the inks and coatings if your parts in China right now are changing to meet these requirements. So if the December 1st, 2020 requirement, depending on the ink or the coating and it's different VOC limits, it does apply to your product, but once it's coated your product, the VOCs are gone. Some companies ask, hey, can you test us to the VOC limits? You're gonna pass. Because once it's a physical product, it's gone. We're looking at the liquid coatings before curing that have the VOCs, the volatile organic compounds. So you're hearing a lot about it. It's for the inks and coatings in China. Once it's on a physical product, whether it's volatile or not, nobody knows at that point. Medical devices have you know, been following us for half a decade now. Um, basically, if you have materials that are invasive, come into contact with fluids or gas going into the body, so invasive fluid or gas contacting, um, if you have a carcinogen, mutagen, or reproductive toxin, or an endocrine disrupting chemical over 0.1, you need to justify, identify it, justify it, and label. So a lot of the work is finding out whether you actually have one of these. And a lot of medical devices do. Lead and brass, that's in that, that path, or air path. A uh, phthalate, of course, in PVC. If you have coated devices, you have the aprotopolar solvents, often in polyurethane coatings, or polyamide coatings. You have DMAC and NMP. Um, some of your inks have imatazolidazone. I can never say that word properly. DV curing inks. Um, if you have it, it's not banned per se. You have to justify it and label for it. So the way it really works out, I'm not going to bang the gong here. Medical companies should be pretty far along. When in doubt, we probably work for the majority of medical device companies in MDR. Um, we do tons of testing. It's just the cleanest way to do it most of the time. So if you have a CMR or endocrine disruptor over 0.1% by weight and an invasive fluid or gas contacting material, first you have to identify whether it's there, commonly done through testing, one of the safest ways to do something this serious. Um, if it is about 0.1% by weight, you have to justify its presence. There's some rudimentary guidance on this. It's basically what are the other options, what have you tried, why do they not work as well, and what's the justification for using this one? It's kind of a risk-benefit analysis. One of the best things is if you have an SVHC or CMR and it's over 0.1%, but it doesn't leach out of the material, justification is really easy. And then eventually label them, and you also have to label the product with a chemical. What's up turning this apple cart a bit is cobalt as a carcinogen. And as of October of next year, it's a, it is a CMR. Uh, cobalt is in most uh, medical stainless steel. Medical stainless steel normally does not regulate cobalt uh, below 0.2%. Most uh, medical stainless steel has cobalt around 0.2. The limit here is 0.1. And so most stainless steel has a cobalt justification and labeling issue for later next year. So eventually after you do the justification of labeling, you have to include it in your technical file with your usual notified body uh, approvals uh, for your product. So very involved. The deadline I believe is May of next year. Um, if you need help, we're happy to help. We do a tremendous amount of this. We'll make it Simple for something this complicated. So I'm moving a little bit quickly, of course, to get through all the topics. Uh, as you probably know, UK decided um, to leave the EU. Uh, one of the challenges for that is they're no longer part of CE, and they never made a treaty to follow CE, so they have the new CE replacement, which is UK Conformity Assessed, UKCA. Um, it's 
the same standards right now, except you have to put BS out front, which makes me laugh, but BS out front of the standards. As of Jan 1st, 2020, the UKCA mark has to be with the product. It doesn't necessarily have to be on it. And by Jan 1st, 2023, it's required to be on the product with the usual CE marking exemption exceptions. So if the product size, fit, form, or function um, does not allow the mark on it, it can be on the package. Uh, but otherwise, it follows all the other CE marking rules. It just has its own label, UKC. Uh, the really tricky part is you have notified bodies. Having a new notified body in the uh, now a lot of people moved the one from the UK to the mainland. You still need one in the UK, and they really need to address how that's going to happen. But right now, the notified bodies are uh, grandfathered in. Now, if you want to be super childish about this, and there's a hidden word hidden in this one, and if you don't want to be childish and you want to be quite serious about this sort of thing, um, I will cover your ears for about ooh the next thirty seconds, um, and maybe hum to yourself. So if you want to be a little childish about the UKCA, put your thumb over the right side of the A and block out the right side of the A, and you'll see a new word appear. Somehow, and a lot of people start to figure this out, they snuck a very interesting word jumble into this declaration. So if you can use your thumb to blot out the right side of the A, you may see a new word appear. Um, it's quite amazing. Uh, output of Brexit. I don't know who, how they manage that, um, but it's uh, maybe by the same people that make co-wrap with a small O to pretend the word isn't what they think it is. Um, Co-wrap chemicalist. Yeah, so enough of the child part, childish part. So I'll go back to the serious part, but it is quite amusing. Uh, UK reach. Um, if you've had to register chemicals, so liquids and powders and gases, not physical products, in the EU for reach, you may have to also register in the UK. And the reason it may have to is based on the tonnage into the UK, not tonnage into Europe. So your tonnage in the UK may be quite different from what your tonnage was into Europe. Um, there's a whole guidance link here on what to do. The main thing is if you have to register, primarily you import over 1,000 tons of a substance. Uh, in a chemical form, liquids, powders, gases, um, over 1,000 tons a year, you have to re register for REACH like you did in the EU in 2023. If it happens to be over one ton of a CMR, carcinogen, mutagen, reproductive toxin like lead, um, you also have to in 2023. If it's just over 100 tons into the United Kingdom, it's 2025. If it's just over one ton in the UK, it's 2027. Um, so depending on your tonnage, and it's a tonnage in the UK, you will likely have to re-register. If you haven't registered in the EU, it's very unlikely you're going to have to register in the UK. And this is around chemicals, liquids and powders, et cetera, gases. Well, here's a surprise one. And right at the end of it, they also changed the name of the chemical family. So it used to be PFAS. Now it's PFAS and PFOA. So it's long chain perfluoroalkyl carboxylate, which used to be PFAS. Now it's LCPFAC. I don't even know if they're trying here. Um, and PF point. So if you have it in a coding of a physical product articles, you have to notify, you do a pre-notification uh, to EPA 90 days before bringing the product on the market. So in a way, it's a de facto ban on these substances in codings. So this is really waterproof codings. Um, ski wax, it will be often PFOA based. If you have uh, makeup, the under layer makeup that's silky, um, that's usually PFOA. It's a fluoropolymer. So basically, these are precursors of fluoropolymers. So it's like coating things in Teflon. That's why it's waterproof and slippery and silky. So if you have waterproof coatings, you have to make sure they're PFOA and long chain perfluoroalkyl carboxylate. That just comes right off the tongue, uh, free. In practice, the carboxylates are super rare. It's really PFOA free. The EU under REACH bans it at 25 parts per billion anyway, so it's a de facto ban. But this is one of the first really US restricted materials. Uh, bans. When Tosca was rewritten for the Frank Lautenberg version, um, they allowed the EPA to regulate substances. And so the way they work in the US and Canada is a little bit different in Europe. They generally create a framework legislation, I guess Europe does that to a certain extent, say with REACH, uh, REACH SVHC, where then individual departments like the EPA or for this or for conflict minerals, the SEC, they create the final rule. So what we're looking at here is a final rule for PFAS and PFOA. Um, Canada works very similar. They basically empower Environment Canada, Health Canada along certain lines, and the actual restrictions, which we'll talk about later in Canada, uh, come through the individual uh, department or ministry, like the, like the Environment Canada. Same thing here. They empowered, under certain rules, the EPA to ban substances as long as they follow the rules in the legislation, and then they create a final rule which has the specifics. Conflict minerals, the same thing. 
They empowered through Dodd-Frank, the SEC, to create the final rule for conflict minerals. And what you generally comply to are the text of the final rule, not explicitly the legislation itself. The legislation gives the high level lofty goals where the final rule like this one provides the fine details. This one kicks in September 25th, 2020, which is pretty darn soon. So if you bring in a new product, it's a different way to handle legacy, with a PFOA coating on it, it you have to pre-notify 90 days in advance. In, in practice, it's really banned. Just think of it as these substances are more or less, unless you want to th jump through a lot of hoops and ladders, banned in the United States as of September 25th, 2020. So uh, what's this one's under scope? Long chain category, perfluorinated carboxylate chemical substance, perfluorinated carbon chain lengths equal to or greater seven carbons and less to or equal to 20. Sure. There's a list of substances, um, which we rarely see inside the final rule, and PFOAs and the PFOA salts. They're much more common, and we do see PFOAs relatively often, sometimes in coatings, but more often as a residual uh, ingredient to fluoropolymers like PTFE. Um, the restriction here is not PTFE itself, it's only for coatings. So we're generally looking at waterproof coatings. have a new restriction, or the first in the U.S. We're going to see more. This is the first of many. So the U.S. federally is going to have materials restrictions. Not like ROHS, more like the Canadian Prohibition or the EU REACH restrictions or POT. More like uh, done like those. So ROHS is done through a different method of consultation and to electronics. These are going to be closer to REACH restrictions. Canada, their version is the Canadian Prohibition of certain toxic substances. Some people call it SEPA. SEPA is the overarching legislation that empowers them, but the actual restrictions are in the prohibition. If something gets added to Schedule 1 of SEPA, all it means is now they're approved to spend money to figure out what the heck to do with it. All of these were on Schedule 1 a long time ago. Being on Schedule 1 of SEPA doesn't mean anything. If we had more time, I'd explain in detail how this process works, more or less. It's when they get to the prohibition stage when you're looking at restrictions. And the main Canadian prohibition today is short-chain chlorinated paraffins, which is a relatively common secondary plaster sizer that makes DHP and DINP work more effectively for less money in PVC. And SCCPs are banned in Europe and banned in Canada. So the ones are mostly bioaccumulants um, for a lot of reasons in North America, if it causes cancer, reproductive harm, uh, Alzheimer's, uh, creates peanut allergy, they're very hard to restrict. If it's a bioaccumulant and affects flora and fauna, um, it's quite easy to restrict. So these are basically all bioaccumulants. So bioaccumulants, things that don't specifically harm you or I, but eventually build up in the environment are quite easy to restrict relatively in the US and Canada, especially in Canada. Um, but if it hurts you and I, it's actually extremely difficult uh, to restrict. The only place you really see that, and we'll talk in a moment, is Prop 65. It's structured differently. So here we are. Um, and I can go over the main chemicals. Now, they originally were going to publish the restrictions late this year. Um, they, it's, it's probably going to be delayed till next year. Likely, you'll see them kick in for 2023. Now, technically, if they publish the restrictions in February of next year, they'll probably appear in March. Uh, Canada writes those really strangely. It says, basically, these are restricted, oh, I don't know, next week, which seems a bit broad. And then there's an exemption for products for the next three years. What? It's a really bizarre way to write it. Um, we have also problems often with Asia, which say, hey, they say it's restricted on this date. Yeah, I know. It's really strangely written. Um, I, I think it could be, should be a national motto, unnecessarily complicated. So it's basically, yeah, it's restricted next week, but there's an exemption for three years. Sure. It's a really bizarre way. So uh, when they do publish it, probably in early 2021, here are the restrictions. And it's banned right away, except for there will be exemptions for them for X number of years likely the restrictions will kick in in 2023. They're already basically rubber stamped and approved for restriction. It is a matter of publication and timelines now. Key ones, DECA-BDE. DECA-BDE is the main PPDE in ROHS we ever see. It's banned under ROHS. Uh, we still see it once in a while. It's a very effective halogenated, brominated or chlorinated, flame retardant for thin plastics. Thin plastics like heat shrinks have trouble passing the candle test. Um, they need a powerful flame retardant. That's usually a gas phase flame retardant. That's a much longer topic. When they burn, the way the bromine comes off and damps down the fire is, is quite a complicated. And they basically always use antimony trioxide as a synergist to really damp it down. So all of these halogenated flame retardants, we're actually gonna show three in a row, all based the same characteristics, they're for thin plastics, 
They use a halogen, bromine and chlorine, and they work with antimony trioxide to damp down a fire. They're all fairly harmless to humans, but they're bioaccumulants. This one's already restricted to ROHS. If your product's ROHS compliant, you don't have to worry about it. If you're not, it's much broader restriction in Canada. It'll be banned in a much broader range of products. So, you, hey, let's say my product's not scope of ROHS in Europe. Awesome. It won't matter in Canada. It's broadly restricted physical products. The only question is when. They haven't published the when. They've published, yes, we're putting it in articles, just we haven't decided when yet. It's not published in the Gazette. Um, Dechlorine Plus is a reach SVHC. It is relatively common, not super common, but relatively common. We even gave examples during the skip section of declaring this in heat shrink. It is another halogenated flame retard that works really well with um, thin plastics. It works also with antimony trioxide. So polyolefin heat shrink again, EPDM, nylon. Um, it's, a, it's a halogenated flame retardant. When it burns, the fire comes off, the so chlorine comes off, reacts with the hydrogen during the excited hydrogen uh, radicals, damps down the fire, and then reacts further with, with antimony to further damp down the fire. So it's the same use as DECA. It's a very common place for DECA BDE. It is a reach SVHC. It is on track to be banned around 2023 in Canada and around 2023 in Europe. It'll be under POP restriction sometime around the 2023 timeframe for Europe. So this will be a new restriction that'll have quite a bit of impact on electronic products. It's not an uncommon uh, SVHC or substance in thin plastics. DBDPE is going to be one of the probably most impactful uh, restrictions in years. It, it is extremely common. It is the main replacement for DECA. It's a brominated flame retardant. It looks a lot very similar to DECA. You'll see those benzene rings, those six-sided rings with the bromine sticking out. Um, all that's different is the connection point between. This one's got a couple carbons in between. This one's got oxygen in between. Otherwise, very structural, similar. The way they work is when it burns, it releases bromines and they'll damp down the fire in combination with antimony trioxide. If you want to try to ban antimony trioxide, you want all thin plastics to just burn. Um, they're what makes halogenated flame retards work. So, which are really important for thin plastic. Thin plastic's not so bad. Thin plastic's really, really neat. So it's very common in heat shrink. When we test for it, because we test for it very rarely because it is not regulated, we find it about one in three times in high-risk situations. When this is banned, it will cause a lot of redesign. It is very common in thin plastics and fire zones. Um, it is probably maybe the most common brominated flame retardant. Your average electronic product might have 20 of these. It's not trivial. Um, so not regulated right now. So any data you've ever collected on it will not have it. If it's, if it's not regulated as bioaccumulant yet, it does not appear in any safety data sheet now or historically. It is not required to be declared when it's additive into the plastic because it is a bioaccumulant, which up until recently is non-hazardous. So that full material declaration, data people think are useful, which isn't, um, it definitely isn't. You're gonna have to redo it. And this is one of the interesting challenges. This is true for a long time. Actually, most new substances are additives, and any what they believe is a full material declaration isn't. This is embedded in the other chemicals. Um, so this one is not, not a lot of information supply chain because until this ends up being restricted, it's not otherwise regulated and has no obligation to be reported, even in safety data sheets. So uh, this one is also on a path in Europe to be restricted, but it's not very far along yet. It'll probably be restricted in Canada for in 2023. When it does, it will likely force a lot of product redesign uh, in electronics, believe it or not. So um, that's the Canadian side, a little more on the US side, uh, last one here. Prop 65 has a number of new substances under consultation. Sure, it has two new substances already this week. Uh, one is an indium titanium oxide. It's not really used in anything. There are tons of really interesting things to get restricted. This is the next list of ones to be reviewed. It has some from a personal level, spectacularly interesting one. Benzophenone is the main sunscreen. It's the chemical sunscreen. The main chemical sunscreen is benzophenone and octosalate. It is literally two of the most powerful endocrine disruptors and thyroid disruptors available. They should never, ever, ever be spread on a high dermal surface area like your skin. You can't get much more dangerous. Benzophenone is so spectacular, it actually inhibits your, your skin's ability to kill cancer cells. It's a very bad idea. But you can buy it at any store because it's cheap. Um, in Europe, they're going through endocrine disruptor regulation. Uh, 
again, in North America, it's very difficult to prove human harm. California has a process to do so. Um, and so that's why these are getting processed. There's the neonicotinoid pesticides. I can never say that word. The ones that kill uh, bees. Um, honeybees, obviously getting in there. Gly glyphosate is one of the pesticides. Uh, parabens, that's going to be very topical because that's very common in cosmetics. They're very similar to phthalates. They also metabolize into an endocrine disruptor. If you know what an endocrine disruptor looks like, like what estrogen looks like, if you look at a paraben, the picture, and you're going, you know what? It looks a lot like estrogen. Yes, it does. It's not safe. Um, and then, of course, all the perfluorinated substances. We were just talking about the U.S. restriction of perfluorinates. It's being banned everywhere. The phthalates were, banned, were getting banned everywhere first, lead first, then phthalates, and then the perfluoros. The next group is the um, aprotic polar solvents, NMP, DMAC, DMF, um, basically the main electrolytes and lithium batteries, and a variety of other stuff. Of this craziness that all sounds very interesting, like parabens and sunscreen and cosmetics, there's one in physical products that's going to be a problem, that one, manganese. Um, it's very common in steel and cast iron. It's, it's really only restricted in Europe in food contacting because it leaks, leaches right out of cast iron, like a cast iron grill, or out of steel. Um, it's going up as a reproductive toxin. You may have a different viewpoint on legislation and regulation, and you may have friends or colleagues that have a variety of different viewpoints on regulation. Um, no matter what your viewpoint is on this one, the submission for this one, if you read it out loud, to somebody, they would literally say ban it just so they don't have to hear the rest of it. Its properties are spectacular. Sure, as an adult, it can create Parkinson's and, and it's very reactive. As most metals, are very reactive to the human body. But what it does for reproductive toxicity and for changing your puberty date is spectacular. Um, sure, it has lots, lots of the usual stuff, reduced sperm motility. Basically, your swimmers are not quite as inclined to make it all the way to the egg and stuff like that. Um, but if you actually read it out loud, all the things you, you've done, people are like, ban it. So this one is, is unlikely not to be a restriction path, um, but it's very common in steel and cast iron. Um, if it does become Prop 65 substance, it'll be more impactful um, than lead was. It's just all over the place. It's a very good chance of getting listed. Um, if, you just, if you go into the consultation, which you can find online, and read its section, read it out loud, and there'll be horrified faces, facial expression by people around you. Like, what horrible thing are you reading? So um, our bodies are really used to iron and use it quite well. So we're quite reactive with a lot of materials, aluminum, manganese, et cetera. Um, and things that our bodies react to, we tend to have impact. So again, um, when in doubt, you have a new product or an old product you're not really sure to do with one of these things, send a picture and let us test it. It's the fastest. Especially if you have a new product. I want to sell this all over the world. Awesome. Let's test it. Especially MDR, where it's so persnickety, you just want to get it right. You like what we're talking about today? You think you know you might actually know something? Um, if you do, I can give you my mother's email address, and and she would like to know that I know stuff, which is really cool. Um, but in general, um, monthly, monthly or quarterly, monthly, eh, uh, monthly or quarterly updates. Um, we sit here and we explain these more specifics, like the two new substances become SVHCs, where they're actually used and why one day protopolar solvent is in lithium batteries, but very restricted, how the other one's actually a family of doctyl tins, and it's really doctyl tin laureate that's going to be a problem. However, in the adhesive where it's used, it reacts and ends up normally below 0.1% by weight, and this is how you justify it. And based on your product, this is what you have to do. Just this, or in some cases, we will justify where you have to do nothing and provide you documentation, we find one of the hardest things in this industry is to prove a nothing. So we often, when there is nothing to do because it's very low risk, providing documentation that you can point at to say why you're not doing something or why you are. Uh, but we also talk about PFAS, we talk about SKIP, we talk about uh, Prop 65 all the time, how, what's being prosecuted, what's really going on, what materials they're going after. Um, we talk about the real restrictions. And we do this for so many companies, 80 or so companies, we have a very good idea what everybody's doing about it and what their questions are. You'd be amazed. You'd be asked a question saying, you know what, who's actually responsible for Skip? Like if I don't really sell it and the distributor brings it in um, this way, what ends? who's responsible for what? And we can explain exactly from a regulatory and a practical point of view uh, what happens. Who's left holding the bag, but a practice who ends up doing the work and why? 
And for the skip side, it's less than three months away. If you aren't already with files ready to submit, it's going to get exciting for you very soon. Um, we can help. Honest to goodness, no matter what you said, hey, we have a great program. I'm doing a web demonstration and product evaluation is not that expensive. And you will learn a lot. You will have incredible templates to use. And from that, we can do any of it for you. But I guarantee you're going to learn things. Um, some regulatory, some chemical. Um, you get to benefit from the world's knowledge. Everybody says they're the best at something. Um, it's a great way to sell. And usually, we also put a, a slide up to show all the terrifying things that are going on. Um, we really aren't good at this. You will learn things. Um, we've done everything and anything, you know, you know, laptops and furniture, but also like a crane that brings up the beams to the top of the skyscraper, or a tractor, or a car, um, or laboratory. I make a blood analyzer, or I make um, very obscure, specialized, professional cleaning products. We've done everything. We'll walk you through it. You will learn a lot. And we're so good at handling wherever you are at today. This is what information of your product you have. Awesome. This is how we're going to do it with your information in your situation. And painlessly. So perfect. At uh, this point in time, um, if you have any questions, please feel free to submit in the control panel and I'll get to as many as possible. I went a little bit over time, but hopefully not too bad. I did go very quickly and I apologize for that. I had a lot to get through. But on the bright side, there will be a recording of this, um, which you can feel free to ignore. Uh, but if you want else to listen to again, you can, but also it's all be available on our website. You can actually slow it down. Um, a lot, so I might pretend to enunciate. Uh, we have a wonderful uh, British chap here, uh, who actually does our software writing, who after, after we slowed it down, stood up and yelled, oh my God, I can finally understand what he's saying, which is pretty funny. Um, for US manufacturer with the EU skip account, do you need to use the foreign user function or can the US contact just be added to the EU account to upload the files? Very good question. The Legal entity has to be European. And if you need help setting up a legal entity in the system, we have an expert on it. We set up a legal entity in the system and then you can attach user IDs to it. So in fact, the user ID may be in Singapore or the US or China. As long as you have a legal entity in Europe, the legal entity in Europe can attach the user IDs to them. So the people outside of Europe can use their IU that could account under the same legal entity. So you don't necessarily have to use the foreign user as long as you have a legal entity there and you create the legal entity in the system. From then on, you can attach user IDs to that legal entity. Uh, hi, under the EU principle of free movement of goods, ooh, I like, I, it's my favorite things. Uh, yeah. Can the French legal entity of company X with proper skip registration be placed in the goods on the German market? Thinking about a global company. So if you're all owned by the same parent, the guidance is totally not clear. At this point in time, it assumes that all of you can use the same skip number if you're owned by the same parent. Worst case scenario is you will give them your file of all your skip registrations. They will upload it and get back their own file. Right now, it looks like you can all use the same skip file, and that is freedom of movement of goods. If you provide it, you change the owner. There is a recipient to another company. They have to have their skip numbers if they're a distributor to upload it and provide it. The end user is has no registration requirement, um, but anyone, any business intermediate in there, with somehow the exception of a consumer retailer, has to register. So you don't, at this point in time, have to register the skip number for different companies of the same um, parent company. My company is in Cork, Ireland, Northern Ireland. You know, a lot of people in the U.S. would not realize there's actually some subtle differences. Will I be able to register the skip database after Brexit? So the U.K. Uh, cannot be a legal entity. Northern Ireland, unlikely to be, able to be allowed to be a legal entity, but there's weird negotiations going on there. Um, you will need an EU legal entity, which could be you, it could be a distributor. Um, they could allow you to connect to their actual legal entity in the system. Um, but you know, it has to be European. Whether Northern Ireland with others' provisions will be... A European, probably not, because for political reasons, they don't want that. Not necessarily Northern Ireland, just the central government of the United Kingdom. Um, so you'll need an EU entity to be the legal entity, but then they can connect your ID to theirs. Is the Excel template available for download online? No. 
however, um, if you're working with us, it's it's part of the whole service. And it turns out the person who asked that actually we actually work for a lot of your other business units, so it's quite available if you if you ask. It is a lot easier to explain how you do it though. Um, it's a fun, it's an easy Excel document, but I wouldn't want to do it without somebody explaining it to me. But no, it's not something we give away for free. It's part of what we do, um, but we do it for a lot of companies, and it's not that expensive because we're most of the work is explaining how to do it and doing the product evaluation using it is very straightforward this is it just like having a um, authorized representative in the eu for medical devices sorta so legally it's to put some poor soul legally on the hook for if everything goes to pooper um that late eu entity is inside the boundaries and therefore inside the court systems of the eu so it it is similar from that point of view it puts somebody on the hook for things going sideways by the way, for everything going forward in the new uh, market surveillance, the new goods package, anything coming into the EU has to have an authorized representative or equivalent. Because they're getting, if they find it's not fair that a factory in China can ship product directly to the consumer in uh, Europe, and if it goes completely wrong, the warranty or the safety or whatever is unenforced because they're not there. So anybody bring anything, not just get anything into the EU, not long from now is going to need a legal representative on the hook for whatever it is, whether it's the warranty, whether it's safety, whether it's anything. So this one is similar. It puts somebody on the hook for legally for skip. Um, but the other difference, it really gives a object in the software of the legal entity, and then you can connect to the object. So it's a little different than your usual authorized rep representative paperwork because once you create it, it is more of a software connection you put into it as opposed to normal contractual stuff. So it, in effect, it's like having authorized representative, but because of the software aspect, um, there it doesn't have all the same contractual type things that authorized rep has. If there's no component article containing SVHCs over 0.1% by weight in a component in the product, does it require it to be in the SCIP database? No, it does not. There is no requirement to positively report or register a product that does not have an SVHC, nor is the requirement to communicate. So if somebody asks, here are all the things I buy from you. I need your SCIP numbers for all of them, which do not have it. Your legal requirement is really just to provide the ones that do have it. So it's one of the advantages, once you've registered all your products or close enough, you do an export file and it contains every skip number of every product that requires the communication. And so anything you supposed to say, anything that doesn't include it in this file doesn't need it. So as long as you upload this file, it covers everything. But there's no requirement to register a product that does not um, have an SVHC. What is the latest update regarding UK reach SVHC within articles? They haven't got that far yet. Um, the SVHC legislation as it is today, the non-skip part will continue forward. Anything on the books in the UK, so anything historical is still there. So the SVHC communication requirement will still be in the UK, but the database requirement isn't there explicitly. Where can I find language indicating there are usual exemptions for three years to Canadian prohibition? So um, going with probably a national motto of unnecessarily complicated, um, it doesn't say anything useful pretty well anywhere. If you go into one of the prohibitions, so if you Google Canadian prohibition of certain toxic substances, it'll have a hyperlink of about 12 or 14 substances. Um, if you find one like short chain chlorinated alkanes, which is our unnecessarily complicated way of saying short chain chlorinated paraffins, if you go inside it, you'll see examples of when it went into effect and how there's an exemption for X number of years. So do they say that explicitly in an organized way like ECA does? Absolutely not. Is it buried in a random section where we have this long discussion of why we got to this point? Um, yes. So no, the Canadian Pro, it, it's there. It's not at any high level. It's only individual legislations. Most of the prohibitions, if you read them, you're like, this is the most rambling thing I have ever seen. We, can we just get to the point? So um, there is nothing that says this is the normal process, but each time you open up a restriction, you'll see that's the normal process. Um, when a restriction appears, say for the chlorine plus, it'll be written in the exemptions table. There'll, be in it, there'll actually be a table deep inside of it. Look for the tables. The Canadian legislation, the important thing is look for the tables or the schedules, they call them, which are tables. Um, all the exemptions will be in there. And then the rest of the write-up will be this most incredibly rambling, I'm not sure if you're going to get to the point problem. Um, yes, unnecessarily complicated. So sorry if I didn't get to everybody's questions. Oh, 
Um, a pleasure hosting everyone. Um, lots of thank yous. Very, very appreciated. Um, I hope this all made sense. Um, it's, uh, if you have any questions, need help, please just reach out. This is always interesting stuff. A lot of this complex chemical. Explaining the reactivity of methyl hexyl hydrophallic and hydride is not for everybody and why you don't report it in most situations. But we'll help you through all that. Thanks again. I look forward to hosting everyone again soon.